Well, hello friends, Dr. Andy Lane Buncher, pastor of Connecting Point Church and the founder of Connecting Point Communications. We're delighted you've tuned into the broadcast today as we conclude our little mini-series on evidence-based faith. There's lots more we could be saying about this. We've really just kind of keyed in on the evidence for God that we see in nature. We haven't really talked about the evidence for Christianity in particular, but we'll come back in a subsequent series and deal with those issues too. I found out that oftentimes this kind of uh, intensive information is best given in smaller doses, so we'll come back at a later time and do another series and talk about the evidences for Christianity that we find in history and archaeology and of course in the text of the Bible itself. But don't forget, go to randylanebunch.org. Under the media link, you're going to find a vast array of resources that are free and available for you 24-7. Our magazine, blog, podcast, past editions of this television broadcast. And if you read some of our blogs, you'll find some of our discussions on apologetics. And we think they'll be a great blessing to you. So access that information under the media link at randylanebunch.org. Also, don't forget to subscribe at our YouTube channel while you're there. You'll find that link as well under the media link at randylanebunch.org. And of course, we would love to hear from you. If you would email us, at info at connectingpc.org. We would love to receive your prayer requests as well as your praise reports and testimonies if somehow God has blessed you through the viewing of this broadcast or through any of our resources. We would love to hear that. I had a wonderful experience just yesterday coming back from the dentist or actually while I was at the dentist I had my teeth cleaned and as I was having my next appointment set for six months down the road the receptionist told me that my book had been a great blessing to her and I remember thinking which book and how did you get my book? But anyway, she'd gotten hold of one of our devotional books that has a, a whole series of devotional essays we've written over the years. Started off either, either as ma magazine articles or newspaper articles, and we made a couple of devotional books out of them. We've got a third one that's still on the way. But anyway, she was so blessed by the book, and so we ended up taking our second book to her and blessing her with that. And, and it's just wonderful to hear that people are being blessed by the resources that we're putting out there. I've often said it's like taking seed and casting it into the air, just letting the wind take it whithersoever you will. When you create these resources, you never were, you never know where they're going to go or where they're going to create a harvest, but we're blessed that people are blessed by those resources, and we want you to take advantage of them as well. Well, as we said, today we're going to conclude our series on evidence-based faith, and I'm going to go to one of the premier scriptures that we use for the foundation of biblical apologetics in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, where the, the apostle Peter said, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, or as another translation says, with gentleness and respect. And so as we said, this word defense here is a Greek word apologia, which means to make a defense just like a lawyer makes a defense before a jury. How does he do that? He presents evidence and gives eyewitness testimony. And of course, we have the eyewitness testimony, for example, of those who saw Jesus raised from the dead. We have the testimony of that in the scripture. Uh, we also have other forms of evidence. We've talked about some of the scientific evidence. We've talked about historical and archaeological evidence, particularly as it relates to the existence um, or, or the evidence for Christianity itself. But we've been really primarily discussing evidences in science uh, for the existence of God. Uh, we could say evidence. I don't like to use the word proof because that's a, a misleading um, a, a misleading word. It's really evidences. And just like you would have cumulative evidence that you would present before a jury to make your case, we're giving cumulative evidence. We've already talked about what are the evidences that we find in nature or what's known as natural theology. God gave us two books, remember? He gave us the book of nature, which is natural theology or general revelation. We can generally understand some things about God through what he has made. And then he gave us the book of scripture, which is special revelation. And by that, we find out about Jesus Christ and God's plan of redemption that he wrought through him. But we, we saw how in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, God is going to hold mankind accountable for the knowledge of his existence through natural theology, through the very things that he has made. The creation itself testifies of the existence of God. Notice what it says, Romans 1, 18 through 20, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Again, mankind suppresses the knowledge of God. It's not that he can't know, it's that he chooses not to know. And as we said, oftentimes, intellectual arguments are really just a veil. They're just a facade to cover up a desire to shun moral accountability. Because if there is a God, there is an objective moral law giver, and that means I'm accountable to his moral law. And so if I can somehow um, convince myself or have uh, some evidences, if you will, that there is no God, then I'm free from that moral accountability that I would otherwise have to an objective moral law giver. And that's what oftentimes man wants to do. The Bible said, Isaiah 53, 6, we all like sheep have gone astray. We've gone everyone to his own way. 
And thank God he goes on to say, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In other words, man wants to do his own thing. I did it my way. That's the cry of the sin nature. And so uh, this, this revelation of God causes us to be accountable to the knowledge of him, which causes us to have to submit to him to understand that it's only through him that we are made righteous through the redemption of Jesus Christ. And so we began giving some of the uh, natural evidences or the evidences from natural theology or the, the created order, if you will, that science has actually discovered. We talked about the cosmological argument. Uh, we know that the universe had a beginning. Genesis 1.1 tells us in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Hebrews 11.3 tells us that he made it out of nothing. Uh, the Bible said, by faith we understand that the things which were made were not made out of things which were visible. And so we understand that God created the universe with no pre-existing matter. He spoke the worlds, the ages, the universe into existence out of nothing. It's what the Latin term is ex nihilo. It means out of nothing. And, and so science has finally caught up with that. 13.8 billion years ago, so they would say, all matter, energy, space, and time came into existence at a definite point in history. What does that mean? That means that all matter, energy, space, and time came into existence at a given point, which means that they cannot be used as an answer to the cause of the universe. So whatever created the universe, the initial first cause, had to be immaterial, had to be transcendent to space and time, obviously had great power for that tremendous release of energy responsible for the creation of the universe, and also had to be incredibly intelligent to, to uh, finely tune the laws of physics so that we can have the kind of universe that we do that permits intelligent life. And not only that, but he's relational because he made a habitation for you and I. He even created an atmosphere on our planet that is clear so that we can look into the stellar heavens and come to know him more. All of this is how God finely tuned the universe and we began talking about that as well, what we call the teleological argument or the design argument. The Greek word telos simply means purpose or goal. And it seems as though God had in mind a purpose and a goal for the universe when he created it because it's designed within an incredibly narrow set of parameters to allow for intelligent life. It's what we know as the design argument or the anthropic principle. Anthropos being the Greek word for man. In other words, the universe was designed with the intent in the mind of God uh, to create a habitation for you and I. And so the universe, as we found, is finely tuned within an incredibly narrow set of parameters. It's almost impossible to emphasize just how incredibly finely tuned our universe is. The laws of physics and the constants in our universe are so finely tuned to allow for intelligent life right here on planet Earth. And so we went into quite some detail talking about the fine-tuned universe that we live in. We talked about how even a number of atheists have come to realize that there must be some kind of designing intelligence simply because this could not have happened by chance. And in fact, uh, I think we read this uh, quote by uh, Sir Fred Hoyle. He said, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion beyond question. But as incredible as a fine tuning of the universe is, I think it has to take a back seat to the fine tuning we see in living biological systems. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about the fine tuning and the design features, if you will, of biological systems today. I'm gonna to start with a quote by molecular biologist and Nobel Prize winning laureate, Sir Francis Crick. Sir Francis Crick and his partner Watson were the ones who discovered the double helical shape of the DNA. I think we've all seen that animated version of the DNA, those that double helical shape with the little spines going across. Uh, they're the ones who discovered that. And this is what Sir Francis Crick said in regard to uh, really the origin of life. He said, an honest man armed with all the knowledge available to us now could only state that in some sense, the origin of life appears at the moment to be almost a miracle. So many are the conditions which would have had to be satisfied to get it going. And what he's really alluding to is this idea of us coming, you know, some living cell just, you know, popping out of the primordial soup. He said, there's just too many variables for that to have happened by chance. Sir Fred Hoyle agrees. We quoted him a while ago about the design features of the universe. Listen to what he said here. He said, the trouble is that there are about 2,000 enzymes and the chance of obtaining them all in a random trial is only one part in 10 to the 20th times 2,000. That, by the way, is 10 to the 40,000th. An outrageously small probability that could not be faced even if the whole universe consisted of organic soup. So what he and Crick are both saying is that life did not come out of the primordial soup by chance. There are just too many variables, too many things that would have to come into perfect alignment. Even if the whole universe was uh, this primordial soup, uh, Hoyle says it could not 
happen that way. We have to remember that when Darwin came up with his theory, the origin of the species, this is 1859. That's the steamboat days, folks. That's Tom Sawyer days. And, and you know, science has made some advances since then. It's amazing to me that we're still trying to postulate how the origin of life began from a theory that, you know, was originated in 1859. But even Darwin never presumed to talk about how life began. Uh, the Darwinian model deals about the evolution of life that's already pre-existing. But when it comes to the origin of life, materialists, or those who only believe in a material universe, they don't believe in the supernatural or the transcendent, they have no answer for this. There is, there is no solution to the origin of life for the materialist. And so we're going to talk about um, some of the design features in living systems. And we're going to begin with maybe one of the most famous, and that is DNA. We just talked about DNA. But inside of each one of the more than 100 trillion cells in your body is the double helix shaped DNA molecule. Now, what is DNA? It's a complex communication system. 3.1 billion bits of information in the form of a four letter chemical alphabet that instructs the cell as to how to assemble amino acids in the right sequence to make the three dimensional proteins that comprise the various systems and organs in our bodies. In other words, we're made out of protein molecules and it, that comes from DNA. And DNA is the genetic code, if you will. Inside of G DNA is the genetic code that instructs the cell as to how to make these three dimensional protein cells. And so it's, it's an amazingly complex system. Now, in uh, going back to 8159 in the days of Darwin, they did not understand this. They couldn't look at a cell under a microscope. If they could, it would have been very, very primitive, maybe under a fluoroscope, maybe they had some kind of way of primitively seeing the cell. But uh, uh, T.H. Huxley kind of quipped in 1869 that the cell was a simple, uh, homogeneous globule of plasm. <laughs> in other words, it's just a little bitty, tiny pinprick of goo. But now we know that that's not true. We know that cells are incredibly complex. In fact, any one cell in your body, and there's, like we said, over 100 trillion cells in your body, but any one of them is complex as a small independent city with various systems operating within that cell. I want you to listen to this quote from a documentary called Unlocking the Mystery of Life. I believe it's from the Discovery Institute in Seattle, Washington, which is a think tank for intelligent design. But listen to what's taking place in your cell in relation to the DNA molecule all the time. Listen to this. It says, in a process known as transcription, a molecular machine first unwinds a section of the DNA helix to expose the genetic instructions needed to assemble a specific protein molecule. Another machine then copies these instructions to form a molecule known as messenger RNA. When transcription is complete, the slender RNA strand carries the genetic information out of the cell nucleus. The messenger RNA strand is directed to a two-part molecular factory called a ribosome. Inside the ribosome, a molecular assembly line builds a specific sequence chain of amino acids. These amino acids are transported from other parts of the cell and then linked into chains often hundreds of units long. Their sequential arrangement determines the type of protein manufactured. When the chain is finished, it is moved from the ribosome to a barrel-shaped machine that helps fold it into the precise shape critical to its function. After the chain is folded into a protein, it is then released and shepherded by another molecular machine to the exact location where it is needed. <laughs> now let me ask you, does that sound like something that came out of unguided natural processes over millions of years? Or does that sound something more like the Ford Motor assembly line? I mean, that sounds like something man-made almost. And the fact of the matter is, much of our engineering is understood from nature. We get a lot of our engineering designs from observing nature. Well, this is a natural factory where DNA is being used as a program code to create different proteins through the assembling and the proper sequencing of amino acids. It's absolutely tremendously complex. This is specified complexity at its best. And this is what converted atheist Sir Anthony Flew. He was a philosopher in Oxford. I believe it was the University of Aberdeen, Oxford. And he um, was an atheistic philosopher. But when he began seeing both the um, specified complexity of DNA and then understanding something about the design of the universe, he became a believer in God. And this is what he said. He said, I now believe there is a God. I now think that it, the evidence, does point to a creative intelligence almost entirely because of the DNA investigations. What I think the DNA material has done, it, it, it has shown by 
the almost unbelievable complexity of the arrangements which are needed to produce life, that intelligence must have been involved in getting these extraordinary diverse elements to work together. He then went on to say, we have all the evidence we need in our immediate, evidence, immediate experience and that only a deliberate refusal to look is responsible for atheism in any variety. Now here's an Oxford, respected Oxford Don, an, uh, a philosopher of religion that was an atheist for years, now recanting his own atheism in the light of what we've discovered scientifically. This is not a scripture that persuaded him. This is the science that persuaded him. Dean Kenyon was professor of biology, I believe at San Francisco State. He's now, I think, professor emeritus there. And he was the one who wrote the book on chemical um, origin of life from an evolutionary standpoint. Later, he refuted the claims of his own book and became a believer. And this is what he said. He said, this new realm of molecular genetics is where we see the most compelling evidence of design on the earth. So what is he saying? He's saying that design is evidence in the created order. Just looking at living systems, biological systems, the amount of complexity there is so compelling. It's evidence for an intelligent designer. So why is the discovery of DNA particularly so compelling an argument for design in biological systems? Why is it evidence of a designer such as God? Well, because the, the only place we know as a source for information is intelligence. Bill Gates, uh, the founder of Microsoft, said that DNA is very much like a computer code, only far more complex than anything we've ever designed. You may know that computer code is binary. Uh, it's just ones and zeros. The DNA code is actually a four-letter chemical alphabet represented, I think it's ACGT, um, by these four chemical bases that are assigned various letters by scientists so that they can track them. And it basically, as we said, is a digital code that tells the cell how to assemble these amino acids. Well, here's the thing. Um, who coded it? Who put the information in there? Did random chance organize these things with such precision that the cell knows how to create a viable protein? Let me ask you this. If you had a computer, a brand new computer, and I were to come up with you to you with a flash drive and say, hey, here's some random code I just threw together by chance this afternoon. Why don't you stick it in your hard drive and see what happens? There's no way you would do that because you know that randomness would de decay or degrade your operating system. Randomness always tends toward higher entropy or higher disorder. It's only intelligence that creates information systems that are specified in their complexity that give meaning and function. Uh, another example of this, was: let's say you go to the beach and you're there on the beach, it's beautiful and the waves have been coming up and kind of, you know, uh, lapping up against the ocean there or up against the sand there. And you might say, see some waves. Uh, you might even see some shapes that look kind of close to like a letter, maybe an M or a W or as the waves are coming up. But, but there's nothing very specified. There's a lot of complex designs maybe created in the beach, but nothing specified. But if you were to come to the beach and in the sand, you were to see a message that said, well, hello, Randy, welcome to the beach. Would you assume that just, you know, the motion of the waves over time created that specified message to you? No. You would probably assume, like I would, that my friends got to the beach ahead of time and put a message in the sand for me. Because again, the only place where we know of, of intelligible communication, of intelligible information, is an intelligent mind. And so the DNA molecule having this information that is specified in its complexity points to a designer just like a computer that has computer code that is readable and functional was created by an external designer. We see the same thing in DNA. And so obviously that points to an intelligence behind this. Now, you know, it's interesting when I was going to school and you probably have this experience as well, but I remember when I was going to school and maybe after lunch, maybe the teacher had had enough uh, teaching us for a while. So she would throw on a film. Back then, you know, we had the big reel-to-reel -reel films that they'd show on a projector. And oftentimes it would be a nature movie that we would watch. And maybe it was talking about how the bees are pollinating the flowers, or maybe it was about the salmon swimming upstream, going back to their, you know, original birth waters to spawn before they die. And without fail, somewhere in one of these nature shows, it would say something like this, mother nature knows how to do this, or mother nature knows or tells, you know, the fish how to do this. Well, here's the problem with that. If this is a, if this is a natural unguided process, it doesn't know anything. Natural processes don't have intelligence. They're random. So they're trying to play both sides. They're trying to say, yes, yeah, a random process, but it also knows. No, it doesn't know anything. It has to be simply matter plus time plus chance if it's an unguided natural process. And yet we can see information in the DNA. We can see design in nature where things do seem to know 
what to do. Why? Because it's programmed into them by an intelligent mind or by a designer. And so the complexity of DNA and its specified complexity points to an intelligent mind. You know, again, you would never think that you could take, you know, a box of Scrabble letters and I don't care how many times you give it, no matter how many times you spill them out on the floor, you're not going to get Hamlet um, out of that. You're going to get random jitterish. It's going to be complex, but it's not going to be specified complexity. You're not going to get that unless there's an intelligent mind. Along with DNA, another evidence of intelligence in creation are what we call molecular machines. Now, what we don't realize is that our whole body, our cells, are ran by molecular ma machines. In fact, there is a author, Michael Behe, authored a book called Darwin's Black Box. And he talked about this irreducible complexity of molecular machines. In other words, these are molecular machines that are made out of exactly the number of molecules they must be made out of um, and all you know, come together at the same time to make these small molecular machines that cause our body to function. Listen to what he said. Michael B. He said, life is actually based on molecular machines. They haul cargo from one place in the cell to another. They turn cellular switches on and off. They act as pulleys and cables. Electrical machines let currents flow through nerves. Manufacturing machines build other machines. Solar powered machines capture the energy from light and store it in chemicals. Molecular machinery lets cells move, reproduce, and process food. In fact, every part of the cell's function is controlled by complex, highly calibrated machines. Again, we see the indications of design. I want to close this by reading you a quote from Dr. David N. Menton. He's commenting on the complexity of the human eye. And he wrote an article called The Eye. And um, I want to simply read a quote from that article to you. Listen to what it says. It says, it has been estimated that 10 billion calculations occur every second in the retina before the light image even gets to the brain. It is sobering to compare this performance to the most powerful man-made computer. In an article published in the computer magazine Byte, in April 18, or 1985, Dr. John Stevens said, to simulate 10 milliseconds of the complete processing of even a single nerve cell from the retina would require the solution of about 500 simultaneous nonlinear differential equations from 100 times, uh, 100 times and would take at least several minutes of processing on a crazed supercomputer. Keeping in mind that there are 10 million or more such cells interacting with each other in complex ways, it would take a minimum of 100 years of cray time to simulate what takes place in your eye many times every second. Friend, I think you see the point. We are so fearfully and wonderfully made that only a designer could have created the level of complexity that we see in biological living systems. And the fact of the matter is, God made you and I to have relationship with him. We are not, the, uh, 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 we are not simply the product of matter plus chance plus time. We are the product of an intelligent mind who loved us, who is not only powerful, immaterial, you know, we know God is a spirit, not only intelligent, relational, he is love and he loves you and he created a world for you to live in that you might reach out and feel for him and reach out and get to know him and discover him. And we're here coming across this broadcast right now to tell you that God who created the universe, who has a mind so brilliant he could fine tune um, the parameters of physics and the laws of co and the constants of the universe to such a precise measurement as to provide a, a life um, bearing universe. He's the one who loved you and made you and is intentional about your destiny. He wants you to know him and to experience him. Jesus said, this is eternal life that they may know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. Friend, do you know him? That's what matters. We can know all this data and be fascinated by it, but it doesn't matter if we don't come to know God personally ourselves, it's all for naught. So why don't you make a decision to come to know him yourself right now? Why don't you just pray this simple prayer with me? You don't have to have, again, the right secrets of words or, you know, uh, go out and try to perform a lot of great works. The Bible said, by the works of the law, no man will be justified. We can't be made right by our good works because we're sinners. We, we, we fall short of the glory of God. There's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. That's why God came in the person of Jesus Christ to die on the cross and pay the penalty for our sins that we might know him through faith in believing in what he did for us. So why don't you just simply call on the name of the Lord. Just say this, dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe you love me. You died on the cross for me. You bore my sin. You paid the penalty for me that I might be forgiven. 
Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my heart to you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, I want to hear from you. Would you email me at info at connectingpc.org? But before we go, I want to pray for you. Maybe you have a physical need in your body. Maybe you need a healing touch from heaven. I want to pray for you and believe God to touch your physical body. Father, in the name of Jesus, we saw that you're the creator of the universe. You so precisely fine-tune the parameters, not only of the universe, but of living systems to where they function seamlessly and perfectly. And despite the corruption of sin, it still works like clockwork. And Father, we thank you that you're the one who made our bodies. You know how they function. You know how they work. There is no mystery too great for you. You are the author of all that is mysterious to us. And we ask you, Father, to stretch forth your hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be wrought by the name of your holy servant Jesus, as they prayed in Acts 4. Father God, show yourself strong on behalf of those that are sick in body, that are weak, that have chronic conditions. Father God, maybe they got a terminal diagnosis from the doctor, but we thank you, Father God, that nothing is too difficult for you. We ask you to stretch forth your hand to heal. Father God, that you would demonstrate your mighty power right now. We thank you, Father God, for cancers dying and drying up right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father God, for healing eyes, the retina, Father God, that maybe has been destroyed, cataracts disappearing. We thank you, Father God, for restoring hearing to the deaf. We thank you, Father, for cr uh, straightening crooked spines, Father, scoliosis, we thank you for healing it right now in Jesus' name. Chronic conditions like diabetes, arthritis, we thank you, Father God, for making whole those that are sick and infirm. We thank you that you bore our sicknesses and carried our diseases on the cross, that we might have healing through the name of the one who died for us. We thank you, Father God, in the name of Jesus, for healing the sick, causing pain to disappear. We thank you for migraines, leaving bodies right now. We thank you, Father God, for healing. We thank you, God, for your rest restorative work right now, Father God, not only in bodies, but in marriages. We thank you for making marriages so. We thank you for financial provision for those watching, Father God, a miracle, windows of heaven opening on their behalf that their need might be met. We give you thanks and praise for it all, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, listen, once again, go to the website, randylanebunch.org. Under the media link, a plethora of resources, more on apologetics, all sorts of articles. Our magazine is there, our, uh, our blog, our podcast, and of course, also past editions of our television broadcast. And when you go to YouTube, would you make sure you subscribe, like, and comment? That would be a huge blessing to us. Thank you so much for tuning into the broadcast, and we'll see you next time on Connecting Point. Mm -hmm.